Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. This episode of The Revolution is brought to you by Vodcast TV. Vodcast TV is Johannesburg's premier shared podcast studio platform, and it is here at Rosebank Mall. Now, if you've ever wanted to do your own podcast, whether it's for you as an individual or for your business, there's never been a better time or a better place to do it. I think that says about just about all of it. I mean, this podcast is recorded here at the Vodcast TV studios at Rosebank Mall, and you could have a great podcast just like this one. Visit vodcasttv.com forward slash revolution right now and get 15% off of your first order. That's vodcasttv.com forward slash revolution for 15% off your first order with us here at Vodcast TV. Now, my guest today is Mr. Carl van der Skaif once again. It is a swapcast. So this podcast will be available on the Kicking It With Carl podcast as well. So give it up for Carl van der Skaif. A revolution is a fundamental and relatively sudden change in political power. An organization which occurs when the population re- re- revolts. revolts. This is the Marco Martins Revolution, powered by Vodcast TV. Visit VodcastTV.com for more. Carl van der Skaif, welcome to the Swapcast. Thank That's you, what bro. what all the cool kids are doing nowadays. Yeah, exactly. And you know, we got to stay cool, be cool, stay out of school. And uh, <laughs> you know what they say, <laughs> don't go to school, eh? <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what a Swapcast is, which is probably all of you, is uh, when two podcasters who have their own respective podcast do a podcast together and they make exactly that same podcast available on both of their platforms or networks. So this will be a podcast on the Marco Martins Revolution as well as on the Kicking It With Carl podcast. Yeah, man. Super, super stoked. Um, today we decided we were talking off air. And we just wanted to talk a little bit more about the entrepreneurial lifestyle, what goes into it. Risk versus reward is practically the highlight for today. And, and I love that. It's, I think it's a lot, something that a lot of people don't know. Uh, they're not conscious of it. Um, and there's this impression, this is what we were discussing as part of this, there's this impression that entrepreneurs live this lifestyle of risk. You know, like risk is your buddy, risk is your best friend. You know, if you don't take (laughs) high risk, high reward, that's the whole perception of the entrepreneur. Uh, Meanwhile, I think there is an element of it, of course. So, of course, it's more risky to be an entrepreneur than an employee in a sense. Absolutely. Because as an employee, you're getting this dedicated paycheck and, you know, your salary comes into the bank account every month and it's such as this wonderful, secure, stable thing. However, there is still this element of retrenchments and something we're seeing more and more of that, oh, hold on, the job isn't the secure, dedicated thing that, that it once was. 100%, man. And I mean, if you've listened to any of my podcasts, I think the first one that I did with Henry Marsh, I actually mentioned that how I got into photography and working for myself actually started by being retrenched. And I feel like so many people as well, you know, when it comes down to the risk first reward type of situation we're talking right now, so many people fear of taking that step out of their comfort zone in order to go and do something that they truly do love. Um, instead, they decide to go and do the A25 the typical old school blueprint, what we've been taught in school and everywhere else where, you know, it's rather safer to get a job. And for most people, I think everybody lives, not everybody, but majority of people who are currently employed by someone and do an A to five and get paid every single day and don't have to worry about that type of stuff. Um, I think a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck and that's a massive, massive risk there. And it's terrifying. It's a terrifying thought, isn't it? Um, I think the biggest thing, uh, first of all, as much as we're saying a majority of people live this way, and it is, I mean, obviously a vast majority of people are workers rather than entrepreneurs. It's just how things have to work yeah. in, in this sort of capitalist society that we live in. But when we were kids, if we looked at our parents and, and the parents of our friends and siblings or like whoever, like if you have step siblings, like their, their mom or their dad or whatever, um, 
this the society of workers and the society of entrepreneurs was even bigger gap than what it is currently like we're living in a, in a little bit of an entrepreneurial revolution yeah and i think it came down to a little bit of a shift that started happening in the 2000s where you would have these you would have these large corporations beginning to outsource certain things to people who used to be ex-employees or to other elements. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, for example, if you had a graphic design department in your company as a large corporation, it's now, since the mid-2000s, started to become cheaper for companies to outsource that graphic design work than to do it in-house for one simple factor, and that's labor law. Yes. You know, it simply retrenchment started costing these major corporations huge amounts of money when they needed to retrench. Whereas if I'm paying you for services, if I just stop using your services, depending on the service level agreement that was signed during this time, um, a lot of these services were you were able to cancel them right away without this risk of retrenchment fees, you know, yes, without yes. so it's it was it's almost a bit of a protection a bit of a shield for corporations to be outsourcing work and it's created this entrepreneurial upliftment where more people have been able to create these design companies to work for the major corporations rather than the corporations committing to employing everyone i think that was a shift that happened in the 2000s and then along with the internet there's also the shift where the corporation's ability to dominate has been diminished slightly, whereas you as a mom and pop sort of business now have this powerful tool of marketing um, that's now affordable in things like Facebook and Instagram, whatever, people can grow their own small little side hustle sort of businesses um, without having to have the budget for radio ads, TV ads, things like that. So you can compete with the big boys in a smaller way, but you can still compete with them. So I think it's been the rise of the entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like, um, as you said there, you know, so many people are able to now start a business with absolutely no income or startup capital. And that's a very, very massive privilege to have, you know, in this type of today's society where if I literally just right now think that I want to start selling lingerie, I can go into Alibaba, I can go and find it, I can go and pay 30 rand for an entire bra and underwear set imported here it cost me 15 rand if i you know do a bulk order it cost me in total 65 rand and i'm selling it for 200 rand overnight almost you have a successful business running and i think you know exactly like what you were saying now with regards to you know your old family businesses and things like that life has changed man it's it's so much easier and that's why you know although i still have so much empathy for somebody who is working the 825 and it might not be something they love. At the end of the day, if you're not doing something after 5 p.m. when you get home and you've got that availability to be able to do that, if you're not doing something about it, then by rights, nobody should be feeling sorry for you. So, yeah, it's, I feel like, you know, we've got this massive help out there with regards to the Internet and our social media platforms. And there is just so much guidance and so much support that it's almost impossible not to want to take the risk. And I think that's really important. I've almost been ignoring what you're saying because there's a, a term specifically for, for what you brought up earlier that I've forgotten the name of it, yeah. where you actually don't have any warehousing or anything from your business. It's a type of business that you have online where you ship directly from the supplier drop shipping. to the end year. Drop shipping. Drop shipping. There you go. I've been going through my <laughs> phone looking for... Googling and you could... Uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah, drop shipping. So it's a whole new business form. Yeah. Uh, something a little bit difficult in South Africa because of our customs laws and, yeah. and our uh, letter of authority laws and things like that from SABS and NRCS and all of those sorts of companies. Yeah. Uh, but it's amazing how you with like you say zero capital you don't have a warehouse you don't have all these expenses as long as you can market the product you can move something directly from the supplier to the end seller via your own little website via this drop shipping process no warehouse costs no staff costs you're reducing costs in such a huge way yeah. that anyone can sort of do it and you're creating these young millionaires in especially in the united states and stuff and it's an incredible little business tool to do. And I think this brings us back to this risk versus reward uh, factor that we were discussing earlier 
of entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs rather, having this perception of their lifestyle being so risky. You yes. know, like the most successful entrepreneurs are the ones that take massive risks. Yeah. These are the winners yeah. in the game. And there's a term or, or a little phrase that I said to you when we brought this up is that as much as there is uh, an objective risk attached to a lot of these entrepreneurial decisions, perhaps objective and perhaps to a lot of people it seems risky. I think to the entrepreneur himself, a good entrepreneur, even if they do this objectively risky move, to them it's never been risky. Yeah. They never perceive these actions as being risky. To them it's safe. It's a safe bet. This is I'm making the decision that I believe will work. It's and there's this perception that entrepreneurs to be an entrepreneur, you need to say, oh, well, that maybe that's not going to work, but I'm going to try it because that's how you're successful. You've got to take risks. You've yeah. got to take risks. Yeah. And I don't think that there's a, a successful entrepreneur that I know personally that takes risks in their mind, like that they actually say, oh, I knew that was risky when I was going into it. Absolutely. I think for every single person who is currently successful with what they're doing, um, you know, they're running month to month and they're not sinking and they're either making a profit or they're cutting even. Um, for majority of them, I think, you know, when they came across the idea that whatever they've now executed, I think for them, it was never a risk. The only person they bet on was themselves and they understood that, you know, they were only thinking about the rewards. They didn't think about how much capital they would need or how many hours they would end up spending with regards to building this business. For so many people, and that's the difference where, you'll know if you're an entrepreneur or if you're just an employee. And with all due respect, there's no, you know, it's, it's not cooler to be an entrepreneur compared to having an, being an employee. Um, you know, every single person is different. And at the end of the day, you'll know if you're that type of person when you've thought of an idea and you've, you've either executed or you're so close to executing something specifically and the last thing you've actually thought about was the risk. So that's, that's sometimes differentiates the difference between two people. I agree with you completely. And um, I think an important factor in the same spirit of that to take into consideration is goal management. Yes, absolutely. This is something that's not really discussed for yeah. entrepreneurial anything. I mean, my, look, I didn't go study business. I don't have a BCom business or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, my entrepreneurial experience is actually largely down to my parents I, I come from an entrepreneur's family you know my father's owned his own businesses my entire life um, and I think that's given me uh, a massive advantage over other people in a yeah. sense from an entrepreneurial standpoint because it's quite difficult to have any entrepreneurial knowledge without going to school for it yeah you know if you growing up and you know you want to be an entrepreneur and you don't go to business school after high school Geez, like I can't imagine if you've not give, been given that information at home, the sort of mistakes you're going to make going into business. Yeah. If you're not given that information at home, how can you possibly know? You know, how can you possibly know? Because there's no way we were taught any entrepreneurial skills at school level. Yeah. And I think that um, this is an important element. There's a lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of racism against Indian people, a lot of racism against mediterranean communities in south africa and things like that because oh they're just successful they're all these wealthy business people and things like that but if you look at why it's so demographic based like these wealthy small business owners in the indian community in the jewish community it's because it's uh, family information is passed down. It's mm. almost ritualistic at home yeah. to teach your children about business. Yeah. And I think that's why a lot of them go into business. First of all, a lot of them historically didn't have opportunities to go and study in specific professions, you know, especially in South Africa. Yeah. I don't think Indian people could go to school and become doctors and lawyers and yeah. things, whereas they're massively successful in that space now. Mm. But you sort of had to just find a way to, to make your living. And a lot of that is that entrepreneurial spirit that you get with the, with the Indian community. And they pass it down. Yeah. They pass that information down from an entrepreneurial standpoint. And there's a lot of cultures that simply don't do that. You yeah. just don't teach your kids about how to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I think that's a big advantage to the people who have that. Well, I mean, let's, let's talk about that, actually, whilst we're on the topic with regards to 
being an entrepreneur, having this cultural background that your parents or, you know, whoever you're living with, your guardians, they're supporting you with this. Because I think for a lot of people who tend to listen to a podcast like this are a lot of the times the people who actually aren't entrepreneurs. And they're either looking at becoming an entrepreneur or starting something on the side as a side hustle, making a little bit of extra money and so on. So, I mean, a lot of the times you'll find those people are, are, are researching so much in terms of how much can I, you know, obviously discover in terms of who is running as an entrepreneur. And thank God that the information is available to them now on the internet for free. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, let's talk about you for a second, because for me, um, I, I come from a background where my dad's been in the construction industry for as long as I can remember. My mom's a bookkeeper. So for them, um, when I got retrenched and I said to them, I'm taking this as a home run, you know, I'm going to take this, this photography that I'm doing, I've been doing on the side and I'm going to literally explode it and make sure that this becomes my full-time career. And it, it wasn't that they weren't supportive. They've supported me in everything I've ever done, but they, they just obviously sat me down. And once again, we're talking about the risk and they just try to bring it up. And, you know, do you realize that you're not going to have a, a steady income? Do you realize that you're going to have to work twice as hard as everyone else? And for you, I want to speak about that. I mean, you come from this background now where, you know, you, you were brought up knowing, having that where some months were tough, some months were really rewarding. Um, what would you say with regards to that? You know, like, did it impact a lot in your life um, with regards to that? I think it, it would be it would be tough to say that it didn't, you know. Yeah. Where, and it, and it's a bit difficult to look introspectively at your life uh, from an objective yes. point of view. So you know how your life happened is something that you don't sit and think about from from a differential standpoint because you don't think about how other people's lives went when they're young you know yeah. it's not a natural thought pattern it's yeah. something that you have to almost force yourself into thinking um i just want to ask quickly so you were saying that your parents brought up these concerns because they always had stable jobs so your father was in the construction industry but as an employee he wasn't yes, self-employed yes, yes. Uh, yeah they construction. were both employed so so your parents were always permanently employed and they sort of aired on the side of concern for you like hey listen steady income is this wonderful thing and like they they had a fear for you yeah of the what what could possibly happen if you don't have that constant salary coming in? Yeah, exactly. Life? And I mean, I think when it came down to when I actually did decide to do this, I think it was 2013, 2014. So it wasn't cool being an entrepreneur back then. You know, we've we, we got to be honest. That <laughs> it's so you, funny that it's so cool now. Right? Like it's, a, <laughs> like it's cooler than a sports star or a rapper. Entrepreneur, all the sports yeah. stars and rappers want to be entrepreneurs exactly. now, whereas yeah. years ago, all the entrepreneurs wanted to be sports stars and rappers. Exactly. And now the sports stars are all selling something and they're, <laughs> they're creating exactly. vodka and this and that. It's like, it's become a thing that this entrepreneurial lifestyle. And so, yeah, like that's, that's another thing I had to highlight where 2012, 2013, somewhere there where, geez, at back then, you know, like just wasn't cool running for your own business. All my friends were like eventually starting to get their promotions. They were getting noticed as, you know, they've been working three, four years and it was, it was something, you know, it just wasn't known. Yeah. So for me, it was just like something else. So I, I did understand where my parents were coming from. Yeah. So to get back to answering your, actually answering your question, I just wanted to clear that up about uh, the mindset with your parents. So I remember very specifically situations where my parents wanted me to, as a young person, have my basis covered for a career. So whether they thought it was an entrepreneurial career or a career as an employee, their biggest concern with me was that when I was growing up, I wanted to be a musician. Uh, and that was terrifying <laughs> for them. Like, what's a musician? You know, musicians struggle to make a, yeah. a living. Yeah. And they really do. Yeah. Um, and I'm so lucky that they pushed me on the side of, listen, cool, you're doing your music thing. And, and we hope it works out as a career for you because we want your happiness, you know, and we believe in you and you can, you can do what you need to do. Yeah. Um, but they said, have a backup even if it's something else you're passionate about that is slightly more stable than being a musician. Yeah. And they pushed me into sound engineering. Okay. Where they said, okay, it's now related. It's something that you want to do. It's something you enjoy. It's related to your music thing. And it's something that at least there's work available for it. And I think they may have perceived it from the entrepreneurial standpoint, like it's a skill that you can develop into an entrepreneur 
yeah. side of things. So I think that's one of the clear things from my parents' concern side. And then obviously in this business of the podcast studio and radio and everything that I got into, uh, the sound engineering bit um, helped a lot in that. Yeah. But so in terms of the clear memories of their concern about where my career was going and stuff like that, that was the clear memory of concern of similar to your parents saying, listen, sit down, let's talk about what a salary does for you and things yeah. like that. Um, beyond my direct immediate household family, my grandfather really pushed the angle of computers. My brother was big into computers. You know, IT yeah. tech, he was a software developer, yeah. everything. Well, and I mean, how, how long ago was this that we're talking? I mean, like 20, 2009? I was 16 years old, so it's 15 years ago. Wow, yeah. So, so I that's mean, like sort of around... That was on the rise of computers and IT and that yeah like and I mean uh, just in terms of what you could have as a stable and, and I think it's still the, the place to be is it's a skill set that's maybe not at the forefront that we expected it to at that point because it was really like bustling at that yeah. time and really bubbling over and now it's it's still growing but it's simmered down a little um, so my grandfather really wanted to push me into computers, especially because my brother was doing it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what you're going to do with music? Oh, yeah. you know, until I played drums at the church, then he was quite happy because very religious Catholic family. Oh, yeah. He was quite happy to see me playing drums at the church. So then I sort of got a little bit of respite from the argument of being against the musician. Um, obviously till this point, I would love to still have some sort of music career. It's, it's still a biggest passion of mine. Okay. But having, uh, let me just give a little background about how I got into the entrepreneurial space and then please don't let me not come back to uh, my parents and the entrepreneurial assistance. Um, so being a music guy, I started building a recording studio up with a little bit of money I was making as a teenager teaching drum lessons. So... You were well, teaching drum lessons for pocket money or what? Um, I think a bit more than pocket money, I'd say. Uh, there were times where I paid for schooling myself and, okay. and things like that. So I was making pretty good income off of teaching drum lessons. I was making exceptional income for a teenager still at school. Mm. Um, but, you know, I wasn't paying rent or anything. So a yeah. lot of that money was I was able to use on a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, um, and, and of course, my parents assisted me big time. Yeah. You know, but so... I was working a job at a music store, Tom Sound and Music in Bromfontein. I was working there on weekends, on Saturdays. Uh, so I'd get like 120 bucks a day there or whatever. Ole. <laughs> Look, it was it was 15 years ago. So 120 bucks a day com then got compared you to now yeah. got you a lot further. Yeah. At least, you know, it was probably the equivalent of earning 300 rand a day, yeah. sort of. Yeah. Similar sort of region. But anyway, all of that money went back into that company. You know, every cent I made there, I spent back there on my staff discounted music equipment, okay. built a recording studio at home, had a recording studio, learned a lot about sound and things with the intention of doing music from my recording studio. Yeah. Then I got offered a job as a sound engineer because I was a studio guy. I, when I was probably 18 years old, I had just come out of school. I was turning 19 that year. I got offered a job as a sound engineer. Um, took the job as a sound engineer, was working in a recording studio in Johannesburg, and I thought, what? Let me, I've got such great ideas for this, this business concept, you know? So I spoke to some of the voice artists and the owner of the company at the time. I went to have a chat with him, and I said, listen, I've got this potential business opportunity that I would like to run with. And he said to me, eh, what are you going to bring to it? Whatever, whatever. And he, he sort of, I felt very insulted that he said, sure, bring me the client and then we'll see what we'll do for you if you bring me the client. And then he, on a side note in that same meeting, he said to me, listen, I need someone to do I don't know, something for his music library and he was going to pay me five rand an hour. Wow. And I felt so insulted by that. I was so insulted by it that I went and that client I was going to bring to him, I went and did it myself. So I just went off and did that, that job myself. I went and got the client and that's how I got into the voiceover industry 
from a studio standpoint. Okay. So that's how I got into doing voiceovers and making money off of voiceovers. Whether I was, and I wasn't doing voiceovers myself at that time. Then, quite a funny story, and it seems like a lot of voiceover artists who are sound engineers have a similar sort of story, is that I, you have a, a shortage of a voice artist. And, uh, or they couldn't make it to that recording session. You had to record a voiceover for a client. And, and you're in this point of desperation because now you don't have this voiceover artist. And, and they phone you up and they say, listen, why don't you just do it? you got a great voice. And uh, that's how I started doing voiceovers, sort of by mistake, oh. just out of necessity. So that's how I started doing voiceovers myself, personally. And I think because I had access to the studio, I was able to develop my voice more than someone else. So a lot of voice artists have natural ability. They just have a great resonance and things like that. Whereas for me, I had to do a lot of voice training, but because I had access to the microphones and because I did so much work, um, that's how I got into voiceovers. So anyway, uh, the, back to the entrepreneurial standpoint that I said you mustn't let me forget. Yeah. Um, my parents gave me a lot of advice straight away when I turned this into a career. Uh, luckily, I started as an entrepreneur very young, yeah. so my risk was very low in terms of I didn't build up expenses. And I think that's an important point of advice I'd give to entrepreneurs. Don't go buy houses and cars and things like that while you're getting your job if you intend to become an entrepreneur. Yeah. So I think my parents gave me so much good entrepreneurial advice. You know, just how to start the company, for example. My dad knew yeah. everything. He's, he's opened four or five businesses before. He knows, go here, go to the bank, open a trading as account. That's a good place to start. Then go to uh, the registrar and register your company name and uh, link it to your bank account. Go yeah. apply for VAT number. Okay, so, like you, had, so, so you had, had a lot of... A lot of support okay. in those terms. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's something that you were very privileged with. For me, it was the first guy in our family to be able to open a business and run it. And I mean, also, 2012, 2013, Instagram was in its infant stages. I don't think it was, knew about it at that time. Uh, yeah. I think that they launched in 2010, and they'd been three years in. At, I think for the first year and a bit, it was only iPhone. And it only, I think, by 2015, 2016, it had become this thing where companies were starting to use it. And in the, the word and the, the, the job opportunity of influencer became apparent. So, yeah, you've got to imagine that back then, a photographer quitting his job or getting retrenched and deciding to take this full time, it was very difficult. It was perceived as risk by everyone around you. Everyone. And everyone. to you, I think this is the point we were getting at earlier, to you, it didn't wasn't perceived as a yeah, risk, yeah. not as much. Yeah, because, I mean, already I was exactly like you said earlier, don't go and create debt just by, you know, wanting to become an entrepreneur. And for me, every single cent that I'd ever made on the weekend whilst I was shooting my part-time because I had a job Monday to Friday, everything was getting banked. Everything was either getting put in the bank or upgrading. My lens was crap. Sell it, buy a new one. Okay, now my camera's crap buy it, sell a new one. Eventually you buy a new equipment. But it was to an extent that I was just reinvesting into my business. And I think for so many people, the entrepreneurial lifestyle, because it has been highlighted as such a glamorous thing, people are so excited to get into this and just start gloating and just, you know, boasting about the most ridiculous things. It's like this lifestyle. Like you see people living in Cape Town and their lifestyle, man, it's like, <laughs> I don't know how they're doing it, but their lifestyle on Instagram, I can guarantee you, doesn't meet what happens off the gram. <laughs> you know, I just have to put it out there <laughs> with all due respect. I've got a couple of friends in Cape Town and I know they're real, but there are so many people out there who are doing this for the wrong reason. Definitely. I think Cape Town has a very different lifestyle to what we used to here in Joburg in general. Uh, you see like the beach bars full at two in the afternoon yeah. on a weekday and you're like, how is that possible? Don't these people work? Don't these people work? Exactly. exactly yeah. yeah. I think the thing with entrepreneurs is that if you're not working, you, you're not eating. Yes. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. It's like literally yeah. that bad. Yeah. And I think that's where the, the glamour side of, of entrepreneurship is, is lost a little bit on people. 100%. And also, I think, you know, when somebody starts a business, sometimes they're starting it for the wrong reason, not only for Instagram or for social media and so on. A lot of people are doing it because, and this is a South African mentality I've noticed. I, two years ago, I was in seven countries in six months. 
I'd met people, I'd networked with people, I'd, you, you know, I'm very inquisitive when it comes down to cultures. So, you know, I'd ask people questions, I'd so, sort of monitor how people are doing things. And something that I've noticed in South Africa with regards to entre- entrepreneurship and running your own business is as soon as somebody sees somebody else doing something and it's successful, they automatically assume it's so easy and they should do it too. Let me just clone the idea behind this and it just becomes happening. I think, I'm pretty sure you can agree, your podcast studio that you've just created, this place hasn't been open for more than two months. And the, the interest, the people who have approached you, the types of ideas that have approached you, and it's because as soon as people start seeing something on an incline, they want to be the, the early adapters. But when you start noticing some things on an incline, chances are you're, you've already missed the bus. So I've technically been an entrepreneur for 12 years. Wow. Yeah, so I started my, I registered my first company, well, my only company, I registered my company in 2008. Wow. So it's a long time. For someone who's 31 years old, Yeah. it's a really long time. I started entrepreneurship very young. Um, There's a funny story that my parents tend to tell as well as I was was six, seven years old and uh, me and my parents, we went to a wimpy restaurant. And my dad was a restauranteur at the time. And uh, this, the service was bad. The business was badly run. And I was really young. And I said to my dad, you know what you should do? You should buy this business cheap because it's not doing well. <laughs> Obviously not as articulate. <laughs> I was young. I said to you know, you buy this business cheap. You can run it better than this. Improve it, make it a well run business, then it will be more profitable. Then you can sell the business for more money than what you had paid for. I was very young. Oh, damn. So um, I love that story because I'm an entrepreneur, of course. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to get into this now. So after you started your business, I wanted to talk a little bit about goal management. After you had actually gone independent with your photography business, did you have goals and ambitions where you thought, I'm going to make bank now? Or were your original goals and ambitions like, I want to make a living doing what I want to do? I think, you know, I think everybody will be different and will answer differently to that. But for me, there, were, there was no short-term thinking when it came down to, I knew what I'm going to do. And like when we talk about now this risk versus reward, and we didn't see the risk. I didn't see the short-term goal. I saw myself as this person five years, eight years from now and where my business is. So with goal management, man, every, like, you have to have goals for everything when it comes down to running your own business. If you don't, you're going to be standing still. And when you're standing still in a business, you're going to die. I think it's also this chaotic running in circles and not having a vision, not having an objective to exactly. achieve and strategy. And strategy is so hugely important in business where you say, right, uh, I need to have some sort of plan in place, whether it's a very, uh, very formal plan that you feel you have to follow to the T every point and you've got everything planned out, or a, at least something where you're like, listen, if in the first six months I'm just about breaking even, I'm happy because it takes time to grow a business. Yeah. And this is what I mean in goal management yeah. quite specifically. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, not, I mean, I'm not attacking how you answered because mm. that's how you started. Yeah. But what I'm now... And, and that's how I started my company. Actually, my goal management was poor in the early stages of mine because I thought I landed my first contract right away in my business. Like right away, lucky. I landed my first contract. Yeah. Uh, not lucky because the product was good and mm. I got a good client and whatever, but it was a bad example to set for me because of the expectation thereafter. Yeah. So I thought, man, a year from now, Bank, bank, buddy. Yeah. I'm going to be making it easy because my business is such a cool business. I'm doing it so well. I'm the entrepreneur, whatever. Yeah. And then, bam, hard lesson after hard lesson after hard lesson. Uh, so it's difficult. And I think those business lessons, what my dad calls school fees, mm-hmm. you know, when you lose a bit oh, of yeah. money going into a business, whatever, yeah, you got to pay your school you've fees. You've at least learned something, mm. you know, so it's never a massive cost as long as you've learned something. Yeah. So you can lose money in business, but if you learn something out of that, it's school fees. Yeah. You know, so I always love that saying. No, I love that. Yeah. There's, there's another saying, you either win or you learn. And that's a, yeah, that's a very good one as well. So, okay. So you were actually asking in terms of expectations of achievements and, or, 
Well, I, I mean, how you started your business yeah. and what you know now sort yeah. of thing. So goal management. So when you started your business, you weren't thinking about like, am I going to make this amount of money by this yeah. date or whatever, whatever. Yeah. because you just thought, I'm going to try this. Yeah. That was sort of your, your exactly. goal management. But now that you're more experienced entrepreneur, your goal management would be something along the lines of, I want to do... I mean, you're in the photography business yeah. and we've been speaking a lot about some of your, mm-hmm. and I don't know if you're comfortable speaking about them, some of your ambitions for what you want to get yeah. into and stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've chatted a little bit about a modeling agency. Yes. And this is something that you sort of want to get into. Yes. So now that's a new business. Yeah. You know, that's a completely new business. So now that you're a more experienced entrepreneur, I think your goal management for that business will be easier and, and you'll have a better perspective on goal management. Oh yeah, definitely. And I think as you you move along and as you pay your school fees, as we've been speaking about, you start learning different ways of these goal managements as well as your expectations. Also, you start having so much more, you put so much more pressure on yourself as an entrepreneur as you get older, more experience and so on because now you know what you're capable of. So now when you, when you were able to throw something, as an analogy, you could throw something three feet. Now when you come and you pick up the bigger ball, which is now your second business, you, you're instantly thinking of that three feet. So now you say, no, that's easy. I got that last time without even effort. Let me throw six feet. So you just start going, you, you always start aiming way higher than what you need to. Mm. And that's something great with regards to experience and so on like that. But yeah, um, you know, starting a second business, it's a little bit terrifying, especially when it's outside of your experience and what you're used to. But I'm very excited for it because at the end of the day, I'm looking to make an impact. Mm-hmm. And as, as, as an entrepreneur, you start moving away and shifting away from just, oh, I want to make money, I want to make money, I want to make money. Yeah. Now it's, there's an impact. That's how many people can I help and how many people can I bring with me with this journey. So your vision for the company, and this is such a 90s idea, I remember uh, having your, your mission statement in a business. Remember when yes. all companies had a mission statement, yes. like this was our mission <laughs> statement. And no uh, one even knew what to put in their mission statement. It was yeah. always integrity, yes. this and that, because you <laughs> thought it was something that would help you with sales. Yes. But your mission statement is actually supposed to be the rules, if you read in business journals and, and textbooks and stuff, your mission statement is... <clears throat> the the rules that guide every decision that's sort of the thing yeah is like someone comes to you with an idea and they're like listen if we bribe this government official we can do this amount of business whatever and you're like torn with the decision because first of all it'll be good for your business and you'll make lots of money and it'll keep you running for a year or two when you're like halfway underwater yeah but there's the moral element to it. Yes. And that's where you're supposed to look at your mission statement and say, but my mission statement is integrity. Yeah. So that makes this decision easier for me to make. No, I'm not going to bribe anyone because integrity is my mission statement. How much of that really happened? Very little. Yes. And I think that people were so scared of the real mission statement that every business should have. And this is the responsibility of every business. And that's generate a profit. Yeah. Make money. That should be the first point because that's what a business needs mm. to do. It needs to generate income. It yeah. needs to generate a profit. That's your first ambition for. But you can't put that in your mission statement. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So I think this is where that mission statement business has gone off course a little bit, this 90s mission statement. Oh, man. Whereas that should be like the first point that you bring up. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I mean, th- the great thing about... Once again, when it's your second or third or fourth business, you're not dependent on that. Mm. So although I 100% agree, if a business isn't making money, it's costing you money. And a lot of the times, if it's your second or third business, it's it's costing your other businesses. Yeah, exactly. And if if business B isn't making money, business A is supplementing money and pumping money into that. And that's the last thing you want. Yeah, if your mission statement is to make the greatest modeling agency in South Africa that benefits all people of South Africa, especially those of low income who are looking to become models, that's your mission statement. That's your vision for it's almost a uh, philanthropic business. Yeah. You know, you, you're looking to help people. That business can't help people if it's not sustainable. 100%. It will help people for the first year or two, but then it goes under and it closes yeah. down. Yeah. So that's where. Your, your mission statement mustn't, <clears throat> it mustn't uh, counter the original goal of any business and that's oh, to yeah. generate a profit. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you could do both. 
you know, and uh, yeah, that's the that's, goal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, you should be doing both. Yeah. You should be doing your mission statement yeah. and generating a profit. Absolutely. And I think also so many people feel that these days you cannot give back or you cannot stay on the the straight path of you know <laughs> integrity that without is. making a good success out of something because there's so many bad people making money yeah you know, ge- generating profits is so much easier if you're not ethical exactly yeah so yeah i mean entrepreneurship in general it's it's a little bit tricky sometimes and i think with the moral code you you got to be tough sometimes rhino skin because you will get a couple offers here and there with any industry of course. And you have to try and avoid it at, 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 at any cost. So, yeah, um, with regards to that, dude, um, you know, so many people, maybe, who knows, we might have a couple of people listening to this who tend to, you know, go off and after listening to this, they might be inspired and they might want to, you know, end up doing their own thing. And I it's feel the like... It's time to do it. 2020, my 100%, goodness. 100%, dude. Yeah, I mean, if you've been sleeping on it and thinking about it since 2016, I think just go out there and do it. Especially, you know, if it's not going to cost you a lot of money. Even if it's going to cost you a bit. Who cares? Yeah. So my advice for this is don't be drawn into entrepreneurship because it's a romantic idea. Yes. I think the best way to be drawn into entrepreneurship is are you terribly unhappy at your job? Are yeah. you unhappy where you're working? Or do you have a purpose for something else? Yeah. So like you were unhappy, got retrenched, thank God, because yeah. you're doing something that makes you happy now. Yes. You know? And I think that's the key, is that you're unhappy in your work. You think of what will make you happy, what sort of career will make you happy, and then strategize about how to turn that into a business. Because the big mistake that a lot of people make is that to just think that you're an entrepreneur and any business that makes money is good enough. There are so few people in this world who are just entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs only, where they are happy running any business because they want to just run a business. It doesn't matter what the industry is, doesn't matter. I just want to run a business because I'm a businessman. That's rare. And that's not going to make you happy doing something that you don't like, but at least you're the boss. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And, you know, whilst we're on this topic, I think, you know, with entrepreneurship, people tend to, you know, I've met so many people. I've, I've sat around a bra and people are talking like, yeah, I run my own business. I do this. And I think 2019, I think it was 2019 when there was this fad about social media agencies. Right. Remember that? It was so. It came was, and went so quick. Because. So quick. It's inauthentic but yes go yes on. and it was romanticized exactly mm. like you said it was it was this thing where so many guys were ceo of this agency <laughs> i you love know? that ceo <laughs> you know and it's like okay ceo of who <laughs> no. you know so that was one of the things where it became this this fad to own your own social media company and people were approaching companies and saying no we'll run and manage your accounts and so on like that and they were they were proposing the wrong type of ideas for the companies. Hence why 99% of them aren't actually around anymore. Just a piece of entrepreneurial advice. You can't be the CEO of a company that's not registered. Yes. If you've just come up (laughs) with your company name and not registered it, you can't be the CEO because there's no such position. (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? There's no such... But Instagram's cool like that. For (laughs) example, for me, I... I started a business so early that my business is a CC, a closed corporation, which you can't even register anymore. I can't put CEO as my title for my CC because there's no such thing. I'm a member. You don't get CEOs of CCs. It's just not how it works. And I think the CEO position was glamorized by major corporations who have a board of members. You know, they they have a board and... They appoint a CEO to be the ex- chief executive officer yeah. of the operat- operating of that business. Yeah. And the board appoints the CEO. You don't appoint yourself CEO of your one-man company. That's yeah. not how it works. Rather call yourself director. Yeah. It has more credibility and it's a little bit more... <laughs> that just makes a little yeah. more sense. Otherwise, Please, founder or founder, co-founder, I like founder. Yeah, founder you know, sounds nice. Founder sounds like a typical Silicon Valley kind of thing, anyways, where it's like founder of. Because you're a startup, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've got your CEO and 
<laughs> I think he, I think his mom is the CFO. I don't know, <laughs> but no. you know, it's it's these things came and went, and that's once again the the glamour of Instagram, where you put what you want in your bio. Yeah. You know, overnight, it's like you know, co-founder of this, owner of this, this, and this, and it's just it's just become this thing where it's it's so easily manageable. Mm-hmm. Whereas I, t- I sometimes like to say you should treat your, your Instagram almost like a CV, you know, where you can't just go and put anything you want on yeah. your CV. And it's actually illegal. Yeah, it, well, exactly. So, no, I mean, it's criminally illegal. Well, there you go. And I think, yeah, people are actually being held. Let's talk about that. Well, that's actually just been, it's a fairly new law. Yeah. Uh, it was reg- put Has forward it just been this passed? year. It's okay. been passed this year. So, it's always been illegal to lie on your CV. However, uh, not that I have the greatest understanding of law and my, my girlfriend Lee should be here for this. Um, there is different uh, elements of being able to prosecute yeah. on on these offences. Fraudulent. So it's always of. been illegal to lie on your CV. However, the punishment would be that if a company employed you um, and you had lied on your CV and they found out about it, you'd have to pay that company back everything they'd paid you yeah. in your salaries and wages and things like that. And, and there would be a, a, what they call a civil matter, you know, where you're able to sue yeah. because you've broken the law. However, for you to actually serve prison time for that was impossible because there was no law in place stating that it's, it's punishable by a certain number of years in prison. Yeah. So that's where this new illegality of CV lying has come into place, where you can actually serve prison time oh, for lying in your CV. So that's that's the new element of the law. So it's always been illegal to yeah. lie in your CV, but now obviously the punishment is possibly a lot harsher. So, so it's considered a white lie now. All of a sudden, it's very punishable. Very punishable. So that's crazy. But I mean, like you think it's it's logic. You know, yep. you're applying for a job, whether you have the experience or not. Mention your your previous experience, what you're capable of doing. So important. And yeah, I mean. At Instagram just makes it so easy because why it's a social media platform and LinkedIn and things like that as well um, for me because I've got so many companies uh, trading companies so yeah. they're not actual registered companies they're all operating under the original CC um, and then that CC has these other individual brands operating underneath the original CC so uh, because they have different industries, sort of different applications like this podcast TV is a podcast studio platform. 440 Hertz Studios was originally uh, a radio station, a, a private radio station media company that yeah. creates radio yeah. stations for, ind- for individuals. Then there's also Radiads, which is like a media buying company that's all just trading companies underneath the original 440 Hertz Studios CC. Um, and I, I forgot where I was going with this, but it's, well, it's I mean, a good point to make just yeah. in terms of how, oh, it, on social media, you've got all of your previous work history and now you've got like 12 companies yeah. that you, that like the CEO of. Imagine you, imagine you, you almost had a, his, a history. So Facebook recently has launched because of the whole privacy issue and everything they're trying to be as open as possible and with companies these days with your your fan page or your business page it is open in terms of your adverts so you could literally go to any business registered company's page and you could go through to their info or their about and eventually somewhere on the page you can see their current running ads what ads they've run how much they're spending on those ads everything so it's pretty open it's becoming a very open book because of how facebook was collecting the data and things like that and imagine instagram becomes like that where everything you change in your bio it becomes almost a historical page where people can go and view how many people would start being more smart about that because now you stop lying and secondly there are so many people who, I think, as we're talking about the entrepreneurship right now, about starting your own business overnight, I think so many people do this because it costs next to nothing, if not nothing, mm. where you set up a new Instagram page, you've got a couple of cute stock photos with your text over it or your logo over it, and all of a sudden, you're this operating business. Mm. And like you said, nobody's registering these companies. Yeah. But you're closing them in three weeks because you didn't do a proper analysis of what was required from this type of target market, how, how you would succeed, who's your target audience, your target market audience, um, you know, how you would effectively 
either push out the product if it's a physical, tangible good, or if it's digital and so on, how would you deliver this to people? So these guys start up things because they think it's so cool and they, they want to be the fastest and the quickest on that. They start it up and three weeks later, they deactivate this, this account. I think, and it, it's so important, like you're saying, it's such a good um, example of the state of things, of saying don't get into entrepreneurship for the romantic idea of it. Yeah. Because if you're only going to do something for three weeks and it's not worked in three weeks and you give up on it, you're not passionate about entrepreneurship or whatever it was you were doing. So I'm glad that it's failed and you've moved on and you don't want to do that anymore because you obviously don't love it enough to persist beyond the three weeks and to put in the work and the effort to make that a success. You yeah, know, yeah. and I think it's such a good example of falling victim to the romantic idea of entrepreneurship. Yeah, I think, but once again, so many people get into it for the wrong reasons. So I think, you know, when it comes down to it, if you're not passionate about something and you just want to make money, cool. But once again, just, you know, do your research. Don't lie to yourself and tell you and tell yourself that's not why I'm doing this. If that's yes. what you want to do, yeah. good, do it. Yeah. Businesses need to make money. Yeah. It's so important. I mean, even for, you know, what's a business's civil duty? What's your social duty as a company? Your social com uh, duty, all it should be, even if as a large corporation, make money, pay taxes. Yeah. The rest is the government's responsibility. Yeah. Generate profits, pay taxes based on those profits, and that way you are, you've met your social responsibility yeah. for your community because the government should be handling the rest. So don't feel bad that if your ambition, I'm not passionate about anything, you know, I don't like running, I don't like music, I don't like photography, I don't like anything, but I see that this business of drop shipping is a good business to have now. And I want to make money and I want to be an entrepreneur. Good. Good. You don't need to be passionate about what you're doing. Yeah. But please have a passion for entrepreneurship. Yeah. You know, at least have a passion for that. And don't, you know, if you don't hate your job, it's not better as a boss. It's not. It's just not better being the boss of the company. Because you know what? If you're the boss of the company, you don't work for yourself. You work for your clients. Now you've got lots of bosses. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then you don't own the company, the company owns you. So, <laughs> it's also true. Yeah, yeah. so it's, that's something that a lot of people don't understand as mm. business owners. But yeah, I mean, if you want to make money, make money. Yeah. You remember the fidget spinners? Yes. You know how many kids in America, or when I say kids, I mean like under Young 20. People. Yeah. yeah, just, you know how many of those guys benefited by being early adapters and did drop shipping with those things? They sold hundreds of thousands of those things. It never ever touched their doorstep. Sold? Not once. Bought? Sold. Who wants to brag? Can you imagine you have like $2 million in your account and like, what the hell do you do? Oh, yeah. sold uh, fidget spinners. You, you didn't need to be passionate about it. No. But you saw an opportunity and you, you just followed through. So those are real entrepreneurs. They're yeah. not passionate about like fidget spinners yeah. and uh, those same people made loads of money when the uh, solar eclipse was coming and they were selling like yeah. solar glasses yeah, yes. and things like that there were mo multi-millionaire teenagers made like almost overnight yeah. via this drop shipping thing exactly. no warehousing no staff they l learnt on YouTube no education even in entrepreneurship yeah. or anything they learnt on YouTube how to design your own website little thing how to do like Instagram ads and whatever and all this you know the, the university of YouTube I call it you can learn so much and um, you know they learnt all of these things as 16 year olds still in high school yeah. you just get the information there from the internet see what's going to happen start your little drop shipping business make some bank I think that's the difference of a true entrepreneur and a person who wants to be an entrepreneur. And you can still become one. Yes. Don't get me wrong. I mean, like, there are people out there, if you study the right kind of things, the right kind of material, you follow in somebody's footsteps who has become successful, you can do it. But there are certain people, it's just in them. They just need to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, they just, like, they thrive on it. It's like the oxygen. And it's, again, once again, a lot of the Americans, the kids, they're going out and they're buying these crazy sneakers and it, it costs like $990, but they're selling it for $3,000 afterwards because there was only 300 or 3,000 of them made and they waited in the cold or, you know, it's, it's a crazy scenario. And they're flipping it. And uh, I remember as a kid when BMW Z3 was just about to come out, uh, my dad would, wanted to be on like a waiting list for one year as a fan of BMWs and he was a successful entrepreneur at the time. 
And it was so crazy. And there were people who got onto that waiting list early, bought a Z3 and sold it to other people who didn't want to wait for it. And they, wow. made, they made money on a car, on a car. Wow. Because they were on the waiting list early, bought the car and sold it to someone who didn't want to wait and they were prepared to pay an extra 300 grand or whatever it was for the car. Look, in those times, 300 grand was probably the price oh, of the yeah. car itself. But I mean, they, uh, they, they marked it up and they made some money flipping things. And I think it's always happened. You've always had those entrepreneurs and now it's just easier with the internet. It's, well, not easier, it's just given more people access. Yeah. Oh, definitely, man. And <laughs> I just feel like there's no ways you can't succeed if you just aim for the right target. Um, it costs you nothing to post something on Facebook. Have you have you discovered Facebook Marketplace? Yeah. I'm addicted. Yeah. I'm addicted. It's a good space to sell stuff. I think in South Africa is a bit scary, the OLXs and Facebook Marketplace and stuff because of the crime element. Yes, in and the, the scamming. Ways that you don't want to go in some, because a lot criminals are using it as yeah. a space as well. Yes. Where they want to buy your stuff, they tell you to meet them somewhere and they rob you. Yes. So I think that's the, the only scary element I would see with it. But I think Facebook Marketplace is the next big space for young entrepreneurs to start flipping things and making bucks definitely i mean if you you listen or you watch gary v he's crazy about the garage sales going out to different yeah. people's places buying something for a dollar selling it for 40 dollars. that's that's massive profit it doesn't seem like a lot because it's one dollar forty dollar the 39 dollar profit is amazing but what else are you going to do on the weekend 100 percent, and although yes we've got the scamming and everything what i like about facebook marketplace which OLX, Gumtree, which are local places for us, like Craigslist in the mm -hmm. US, um, is the fact that with Facebook um, Marketplace, you can at least go to the person's profile. Yeah. And a lot of it, yes, they might still be private, but it shows, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it shows when they created the account and yeah, you can yeah. kind of see the activity. There's less, less anonymity exactly on facebook marketplace than what there is on olx so it probably is making it a lot more difficult for for criminals yes and then also the great thing is a lot of people who are selling stuff near you have two or three mutual friends and yes. then like does this person have two or three mutual friends see who those friends are if you really think it's shady drop a message to your friend and say listen do you know this dude yeah is he cool what's his story whatever and that gives you that edge exactly and that's something that facebook has over everybody else yes and Right now, Facebook isn't taking any money because obviously you're meeting with the person, you're selling it off. I don't think offline. they'll ever take money because they're able to advertise there. Yeah. I mean, well, they're holding the attention and attention is the currency right now. Especially of advertising. Mm -hmm. I think like uh, Mnet used to hold the attention in the 90s with the TV show Friends because you wanted to watch Friends. Yeah. And then they could sell the ad space on that space because they had the attention. And I think Facebook, they... Facebook's a multi-billion dollar company just on ad revenue yeah. because there's no other profit stream for Facebook, you know? Yeah, it, it actually just hit me when you were talking about that now. Facebook is making money. So what happened the other day was I was scrolling and I'm looking for a TV unit. So I type TV unit, brings up, and you can, dis you can decide. Um, I chose within 30 kilometers of my location. Yeah. So first of all, it's picking up where you are, so it's the most convenient within mm -hmm. your area. Type TV, TV units, it shows me all furniture. I start scrolling, couple scrolls, Corey Craft. Yeah. Couple scrolls, Waylands. Yeah, so, so it's a sustainable business model yeah. for them because they can sell ad space. And it's to the right kind of audience. Absolutely. I'm not scrolling, looking at people wishing my friends happy birthday on Facebook and then Corey Craft. I am looking for something specific. So now they're targeting the right kind of audience, which is a great user experience. So clever. Such a good business model. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, to me, that's, that's something where that's where we're evolving. And that's where, just like Gary Vee, if you're really interested in this, you could literally spend hours every single night when you finish with your work. If you're looking for a side hustle, go on there. You find yeah. somebody who's selling a kettle for 20 rand. You sell it for 40 bucks. Okay, so to close off, because we're going to sit and talk here all day. <laughs> just a couple quick little rules for what we've discussed just to, just to think. Number one, I'd say don't just go be an entrepreneur because of the romantic idea of entrepreneurship. If you're happy working your job, stay happy. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like There are so many people who I know who have such a good job, and it's the stability of that income Plus, they have decent hours. Plus, they, their boss is a decent person as well. And to me, I'm jealous sometimes of that. I'm like, you, you have it all. Yeah. You have it all. 
Okay, number two, if you are looking to go into entrepreneurship to change your unhappy situation, but you're not necessarily just an entrepreneur, you're not just passionate about wanting to make money and flipping stuff or whatever, find something you're passionate about, turn that into a business. Yeah, I mean, I agree, disagree. Find a passion, but if you don't have a passion, find something that's actually going to work. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Like we said, the fidget spinners, that, yeah. was, that was a massive thing. Right now... People are trying, well, they're trying to import now this, the safety masks because of the virus. Yeah. So people are advertising all over that they're looking for this. They're looking for 100,000 units of these things. The problem is all the supplies in China and they can't it ship it out to you because there's no flights. I, I, I found the irony of that because 99% of things, especially like that type of material, is produced in China. Yeah. So <laughs> it is a little bit funny. But I mean, yeah, if you find a passion in something, it doesn't need to be... But you're right. Find a passion to make it a success. It doesn't need to be a passion about... You don't need to be passionate about the product. Mm. Be, a, be passionate about the process. Yeah. I think that's, that's very specific to entrepreneurs. So if you're not necessarily entrepreneurial-minded, I'd recommend that you find a job that you're passionate about. Because yeah. if you're just looking to, to make money off of your own business and you're not necessarily entrepreneurially inclined, I would only recommend becoming an entrepreneur if you're able to do something that you know you're passionate about. Yeah. Like, like the two of us who are creators and we've managed to create businesses that we're passionate about, which is going to be most people. Yeah. But if you're passionate about video games, then go open like a little video game store and speak to other gamers. Like that's something you're passionate about. Yeah. You know, okay, maybe don't open a video game store at all because <laughs> it's not a good business because everything's purchased online. Yeah, it's running down. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's running down. Changing. But I mean, it's it's just an example of, yeah. at, or, or look for the gap in that market. Yeah. You know, whether it's video game controllers and you're going to customize them. Yeah. You know, you, you like handy or, you know, something along yeah. those lines that you don't necessarily know that there's a business for your passion. I think that's a good place to start with entrepreneurship because you can do something you love and you can do it on the side while you're still working. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And at the end of the day, just do it. Like stop, yes. stop being paralyzed by the idea of thinking of executing and just execute because that's such an important thing. But also, you know, whilst we're on the topic of the passion and so on like that, you've got to be so, th you've got to have such rhino skin when it comes down to being an entrepreneur because... There are so many people who are rooting for you to fail, which yeah. is strange. I don't understand and I don't know where the ethics and the culture comes from that. But I think, pe I think it's a jealousy thing because everybody's so scared to do it that they envy you. Mm -hmm. A little bit. I think that's a little bit of a famine mentality as well, is that if you, you're scared of, of uh, business being taken away from you, you're scared of your meal being taken away by someone else's success. I think it's this famine mentality that we have, especially in South Africa, because the economy is tough and yeah. stuff like that, and business is hard. If it, I think your biggest haters in business are, is your competition in business. Yeah, They're your biggest haters, and they're the ones who are trying to tear you down because they think you're taking all the business away from them. I think yeah. that's, that's one of the elements. And then number two, jealousy is, of course, a, a factor where uh, they want you to fail because it makes them feel better about themselves. Yeah, and... So going forward, if you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or doing anything on the side where you're going to be on your own, you've got to understand that it's going to be tough and you're going to fail. And every time you fail, you've got to just learn, just like we said in the beginning. You either win or you learn. And you just need to know that whatever you're doing and whatever you're setting in place to do, you need to just be prepared to keep moving forward. Keep it moving, brother. Yeah. Okay, then number four and the last point that I'd like to point out for advice for entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. expectations and goal setting. Do not expect to be making bank straight away. My expectations, for example, for this new business of mine is my goal setting for it is cover you my company expenses and personal expenses for a year. For a year. Just 12 cover. Months. 12 minimum. 12 months. That's the only goal. I don't want to, the company doesn't need to generate real profits, just cover my personal expenses and the company's expenses for a year. And then thereafter, start looking at generating profits because it takes time for a business to become a success. Yeah. And I think that's my only goal. You know, I'm not creating expectations of making bank, you know, making huge amounts of profits early on. Yeah. I do want the company to, to make really good profits. I, I want the company to be a big success. But if I can not 
raise my lifestyle, but maintain my current set of expenses, maintain the, co- the company's current set of expenses for a year, I'm happy. Yeah. I think that's pretty decent, man. Like that, that's a very good mindset to have. And we look at Steve Jobs. We look at all these guys who have started their businesses from their garages. Yeah. And I think today's modern day society, the Gen, the Gen Zs, I think they've been watching too many videos of these youngsters with their R8s and things who are promising the world. And they're saying, within six months, I made this much. And, you know, Forex trading, this and that. Let's, don't get me wrong. You can make money in anything. As long as you do it right, you get in the right place and you, you, you invest the right amount. But you investing a thousand rand is not going to buy you an R8. Yeah. And people are expecting that within like six months, 12 months. Well, let, let's be honest. Uh, it's, you, you can't do anything. Yeah. The, okay, Gen Z's, sorry to <laughs> burst your bubble. Yeah. You can't do anything. That's it. You can't just do anything. It just doesn't work like that. And stop looking at people's end results and um, stopping there. Dig deeper. When you see someone else with massive success, try to look deeper into how they got there. Because a lot of the time, uh, they're either con artists saying, I made this much money in this amount of time, whatever. Stop watching those videos. Not going to help you. End of story. Number two those massively successful people that you aspire to be like, the real ones, look at what it took for them to get there and not the end result. Yeah. Because it's not overnight. For 99.9% of them, it's not overnight. And then number three, buy a house with a garage because of how many companies are successes starting <laughs> in a garage. Yeah, exactly. There, there's your startup. <laughs> there's if your you don't startup. start up in a garage, you're not going to be successful. You can't be successful. Impossible. If you start in an office... You're going to fail. Yeah, you've, you've skipped a few steps. Of course, we're joking. Uh, <laughs> don't necessarily start your business in a garage, but key points. Um, don't be given into the romantic idea of it. Set realistic goals. Uh, start. That's a big thing. Don't yeah. just talk about starting. Think about starting. Yeah. Right. Start. Do. Yeah. Do what it takes and be passionate about what you do. Yeah, absolutely, man. At the end of the day, I'd rather be sitting around a fire with my friends and tell them about how many businesses that have failed then sit there and just listening to everybody else talking about companies that they've started. Some are successful, some aren't, but I'm just sitting there and I've never ever done anything because I've had these ideas and I was going to do that first, but he did it first. And, you know, I was just busy working on this and getting stock or thinking of a better business model and so on. So, yeah, just execute. Execute. Execution over ideas. I agree with yeah, you completely. Yeah, definitely. Awesome, man. Mr. Carl van der Skeif. Mr. Marco Martins. <laughs> Thank you so much, my brother. <laughs> Thank uh, you. What bro. a great podcast. I really enjoyed it. I've had four podcasts on my show and two of them have been new. Well, you know, um, I'm two out of four. <laughs> <laughs> so if you are listening to this podcast via the Marco Martins Revolution, be sure to check out Carl van der Skeif's Kicking It With Kyle. If you are listening to this podcast on Kicking It With Kyle, then please do the same for me, the Marco Martins Revolution. It has been a swap cast. Yay. So much fun. Yeah, man. Thank you, Carl. Awesome. And until next time, keep kicking it with Carl. <laughs>